Hello everyone, and on behalf of Gail and all of us at the gallery, we want to thank you for having us be a part of the discussion this evening. Since we've heard from the other panelists about sculpture within the home, I want to move the discussion outdoors and talk a bit about sculpture in the landscape. So a quick background introduction. In June of 2021, Gail Severn Gallery will celebrate its 45th anniversary. We represent both emerging and established artists working in a variety of media and show a number of sculptors in our physical gallery space, including those who work in glass, ceramic, bronze, fiber arts, and mixed media. We also have a two acre sculpture garden where we showcase a variety of outdoor pieces, both on the small and large scale. So I guess you could say that sculpture plays a large role in our gallery programming. Since it's December, sadly, I'm unable to give a live tour of our sculpture garden, so instead I thought I'd discuss both the aesthetic and practical considerations to take into account when collecting outdoor sculpture. The images herein will highlight a few artists featured in our sculpture garden, as well as a few recent client installations. When many people think of outdoor sculpture, what comes to mind is larger public installations, but Outdoor artwork can also be effective in the private garden setting. Sculptures can really enhance the natural beauty of the environment. They can also establish architecture within a landscape, providing a seamless transition between interior and exterior, and also helping to define outdoor living spaces. When considering work for an outdoor space, I always encourage our clients to look at a garden much as they would an interior space in that it can be curated to create an overall aesthetic feel. With that said, the options for outdoor sculpture are and can be quite overwhelming. And so answering a few questions ahead of time can help narrow your focus, define scale, and also inform the medium. So there are a few questions that I encourage clients to consider when looking for outdoor sculptures. And here they are. <laughs> will that sculpture be a focal point or will it fit more seamlessly within the landscape? And within that question, how do you want the sculpture to interact with its surroundings? Ultimately, what is the style and mood you are trying to achieve? Location and placement. Here we see a Julie Spidell at a client's home. Where will you be viewing this piece? Will it be from a great distance as you approach the property, maybe in an entryway or a portico, or will it be viewed from interior spaces as we see here? Will this be placed in a more intimate outdoor setting like a pool or patio? All of these decisions will help determine the scale of the piece you're looking for. Here's an example of a Will Robinson fountain that we placed in the entrance courtyard of a client's home here in Sun Valley. The current taste for homes, particularly in the Pacific Northwest, is for a very contemporary clean lines, um, the Olsen Kundig style, if you will. Um, these homes employ the use of stark industrial materials like steel, glass, and concrete. And so these structures are really minimal and very rectilinear in focus. So adding sculpture can really provide a great contrast to the hard edge lines of the home. The polished black basalt of this Will Robinson sculpture plays really well against the aluminum facade and also matches the steel trim, but it also provides a welcomed organic shape and a lovely oral element of moving water to greet guests as they enter the home. Being outdoors, Another consideration is that the background is always changing. Trees grow, plants bloom, and leaves fall, and it's always evolving. So this is really important to consider when choosing pieces, not only for the practical concerns of spreading tree roots and growing branches, but also how pieces will look in each season. So much like flower beds that are curated to bloom in different seasons, certain sculptures can sing beautifully in certain seasons as well. We have many clients here in Sun Valley who select pieces of darker granite and basalt that appear pristine and elegant against the blanket of white snow during our winter season. Another consideration is, do you want the piece to be functional or, or, and serve a practical purpose within the space, like this bench we see here by Will Robinson? And lastly, 
Do you want the piece to be kinetic or static? Here we see a fountain by Will Robinson, so there's always a lovely movement within the piece. Do you want the movement to be interactive? These are all really good questions to ask before beginning your search. I thought I'd share this Will Robinson sculpture we installed in a client's home, as I feel it's a really excellent example of how a well-placed piece can enhance the landscape design and also provide balance within an outdoor space. As you can see, there's a strict linearity to the plantings and the concrete walls. And so the verticality, the circular pinnacle, and organic shape of this piece strikes an excellent balance within the overall landscape design. We have clients that consider artwork in the initial planning stages of building a home, and they'll incorporate areas for sculpture into their landscape design to house a specific piece. But we also have clients who come to collecting pieces later, so there's really no wrong or right way to incorporate outdoor pieces. This Bruce Beasley bench we see here serves a functional purpose on the patio for seating, and it defines the patio space. But it also does a really excellent job of echoing the angles and lines of the architecture, particularly the horizontal transoms of the windows, which draws the eye downward and into the outdoor living space. And this creates a seamless transition between indoor and outdoor architecture. So now you've chosen your sculpture, what next? Well, there are many practical considerations that do come into play. Just as you maintain your indoor collection, outdoor sculpture requires proper care and maintenance as well. And you wanna earmark a portion of your overall budget towards a sculpture's proper care and maintenance over its lifetime. A phrase I live by is, don't buy an expensive bike and a cheap lock. I think this applies to any investment, but especially to maintaining an artwork. So regional environmental factors are important to consider when arranging a maintenance plan. Here we see some hungry seasonal visitors in our sculpture garden. While they look cute, <laughs> they are big animals, and so we always think about placement and how to secure works properly in our garden. Other things we have to consider here, being at such a high altitude, is the UV factor and the extremely dry climate, which comes into play with painted pieces and works with wood that can dry out if not slowly acclimated. We also have to prepare for heavy snow loads in the winter and very cold ground temperatures, especially when it comes to fountains and pieces that expand and contract. Snow melt in the spring is also something we prepare for, and the occasional earthquake or two. Being from the southeast coast myself, I'm aware that Florida and surrounding areas have a host of other environmental factors like humidity, airborne salinity, and even greater concerns like flooding, tropical storms, and hurricanes. In coastal climates, for example, bronzes would require a more robust maintenance schedule of cleaning and waxing to protect against any airborne corrosion, like bronze disease, which occurs from chlorides in salt air interacting with cuprous metals and copper. And really, anywhere you are, there are always common factors like UV exposure, bird excrement, and tree sap, even sprinklers to contend with. So I don't mention these to scare anyone off from owning and appreciating outdoor sculpture, but merely to enforce the importance of properly caring for your work. And that thought should also go into choosing the right pieces that will thrive in the environment with proper care. So far, I've shown mainly stone and bronze pieces, so I thought I'd highlight another June Kaneko as an example of a glazed ceramic sculpture. Ceramics work quite well outdoors. Clay itself is intrinsic to the outdoors, and I believe the material provides a sense of softness, while the glazing allows for a great variety and contrast to the surroundings. I think it's also important when considering outdoor sculpture to know that natural wear and aging is an acceptable and can be a really beautiful part of owning a piece of art. It's the natural course of bronze, for example, that the patina will slowly mellow and deepen over time. And this can be considered one of the joys of owning a bronze work. 
Another important consideration is what's involved in the installation and deinstallation of outdoor sculpture. Really, with any 3D art object, you have to think about installation differently than you would a two-dimensional piece. And the same is true for how the sculpture is packed. The weight, fragility of the piece, which may include any weak points, welds, areas of tension, and also the surface coating or patina all need to be considered during packing and installation. So you really want to be sure your budget includes any extras that may go into the installation of a piece to include art professionals, the renting of a crane or forklift, the moving of any plantings or sprinkler heads and lines, or the creation of a concrete pad or fabricated base. So as I mentioned, there can be a lot that goes into moving larger pieces of sculpture, and you do want to make sure you have the right people for the job. So ask plenty of questions and make sure you're working with professionals. Your gallery from where you're purchasing the piece should be able to assist you with arranging an installation or refer you to trusted professionals who can get the job done. They should also provide you with instructions for proper care of your artwork. We have a sister company, um, Severn Art Services, which provides framing, shipping, installation, appraisal, and conservation liaison services to our clients. So I will leave you with one final thought. They are the three things that I tell every client they should have to accompany pieces in their collection. They are pictures, records, and valuations. Pictures, not just of the piece of work, but pictures of the packing materials, how the piece was packed, and any pictures of installation in case you ever need to move it. So 3D pieces can be really complex and we all think, we like to think our memories are better than they are. <laughs> so it's very easy to forget how things were secured on a crate or a pallet, or maybe where each strap went and, and where it went and it's hard to do without pro proper photo documentation. Records. Keep any care and maintenance records you may have, any instructions from the artist, contact information for your representative gallery, and for your maintenance professionals that help you maintain your sculpture. And thirdly, valuations. Please get regularly updated valuations, especially for higher value pieces of art for any part of your collection, but especially for outdoor works. For all its beauty, things do happen in nature that we cannot control. Locally, we've dealt with everything from avalanches to wildfires, so updated valuations are so important should you need it. Hopefully we will never need them, and they are something to factor into your budget. But like I said earlier, don't buy an expensive bike without buying an expensive lock. So I hope my quick tips on the aesthetic and practical considerations of choosing outdoor sculpture was helpful. I also hope you enjoyed the virtual tour of our sculpture garden. <laughs> virtual is something we have all been doing a lot of recently, I'm sure. But you know, virtual is also really a great thing. Technology is such today that we're able to provide our clients with mock-ups and videos to help them envision how a piece may look in a space, either using Photoshop or other forms of technology. And this is true for indoor and outdoor work. It's really a great tool because clients don't have to live nearby to have the opportunity to view pieces and they don't have to incur the expense and time involved with out-on approvals. Here's an example of our Photoshop services and a side-by-side -side of our rendering and an actual installation of a Julie Spidell. We've done a great deal of this over the past year, but it's a service we always willingly provide to clients that live both near and far. With all the proper considerations in place, outdoor sculpture is a great addition to any collection and will bring continued enjoyment for many years. I hope I've enticed you all to come visit us in Idaho and explore the wonderful area of Ketchum and Sun Valley, and of course, to visit us at the gallery and sculpture garden. 
Knowing that isn't the easiest of tasks these days, if you'd like to see more views of the garden and our artists on view, please do pop over to our website where we have a dedicated sculpture garden page. Also, if you have any questions about my presentation, our artists, or outdoor sculpture in general, please feel free to reach out to me by email. We'd love to hear from you. On behalf of all of us at Gail Severn Gallery, we want to thank you for including us in this panel discussion.